ABQ, could, could you guys are introductions at this time and get started. To my left, we have a woman who has dedicated her life to public service, uh, who I know firsthand works relentlessly on behalf of others, people in need, people who need health care, and even public safety on behalf of firefighters and paramedics. And uh, with great honor, a true public servant, I introduce to you uh, Congresswoman Michelle Lujan Grisham. Thank you for being here. Tremendous rising star in Mexico politics, in my opinion. Uh, this gentleman hit the floor of the Senate and uh, is able to debate and opine uh, like no other. I'm very, very impressed, not only with his intelligence and his service, but his heart. New Mexico State Senator Jacob Canadani. We have two exceptional, exemplary public servants here with us today appropriate as it can be. Uh, we have someone who I had the pleasure of working with um, early in my career, and that is someone who served our community selflessly. That is a retired commander, Robert Balanaga, with Albuquerque Fire Department. We also have a 25-year veteran of the Albuquerque Police Department who also served this community selflessly and has also been an outspoken advocate of the men and women that serve the police department here in Albuquerque. That's David and Gilmore. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, who, by the way, is celebrating a 10th year anniversary of La Politica, Mexico Politics with Joe Monahan. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you, Diego. It's great to be here. It's great to be with uh, two of the three mayoral candidates. And I think we're going to have a good discussion today on some of the important public safety issues facing our community. They've been in the news so much the last uh, several years that this is a great opportunity for the audience here and the audience via the media to get more informed on these important issues and how they're gonna cast their ballot. And uh, the early voting is, is underway already, so I know folks are gonna be anxious to hear what Mr. Donnelly and Mr. Hay have to say today on how they view these important issues for uh, your membership for the community at large. Um, if I may, sir, let's take a moment to thank you for your professionalism, professionalism and your courage to have so much confidence. 
the professionalism and your courage uh, on your blog. We don't always see eye to eye, but uh, we really appreciate your service as well, sir. Thank you. Well, good. I owe you a lunch for that. <laughs> statements of five minutes each for the candidates then each of our panelists will ask a question and both get three minutes to answer uh, that question there's not going to be any rebuttal then we're going to close it down with 10 minute statements so they can go in depth perhaps on other issues not just public safety in that 10 minute block about how they see the vision and what their vision is for the uh, uh, city of albuquerque uh, mr hay is going to go first uh, we welcome him to the podium for his opening statement of five minutes Paul, thank you for being here. Well, thank you all for having me. Podiums, I hate podiums. <laughs> Separates me from everybody, and plus you can't see me. <laughs> and I'm vertically challenged. Never say short. I'm running for mayor because I care about this city. I've been a police officer in this city for 25 years. I retired in 2011. I know what the city is facing. Nobody has to tell me the challenges of this city. I have seen them up close and personal in my face for the past 25 years. I know what it is to be a city employee. And I know what it is to receive the treatment that the city employees have been receiving. I know what it is to be a citizen of this city, to be faced with unemployment, to be faced with high crime, to be faced with drugs, in our schools and on our streets. I know what it is to be a citizen and see our children uneducated and nobody doing anything about this. We have to get this city moving and I have plans to do that. Immediate plans to jumpstart our economy and long-term plans to fix our economy permanently. Albuquerque cannot survive, ladies and gentlemen, in the direction that it is going. We're on the top of every bad list that comes out. Forbes magazine reported if you're going to start a business or if you're going to build a home, don't do it in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We lost more jobs in Albuquerque last year than anywhere else in the entire United States. Where the rest of the country is recovering slightly, the unemployment rate in Albuquerque increased last month. Now headlines in the paper, home prices in Albuquerque, the only city in the country, dropped. We are 101 out of 102 cities for economic growth. We cannot survive as a city facing these problems. We can do better, and under my administration, we will do better. And by the way, I'm not the other Republican in the race. I'm the only Republican in the race. <laughs> Mayor Barry is the poster boy for what the Republican Party has become. The Republican Party has lost its way. They want to cater to special interests, and they want to cater to, as Mr. Barry always says, his friends, his friends, his friends. I'm talking to an empty chair yet once again. Every forum I go to, the mayor doesn't show up at, unless it's put on by his so-called friends. Well, I consider everybody in this city a friend of mine. I want to do for everyone in this city, and I want to take care of our city, and I will. That is a promise that you can take to the bank. Thank you. My name is Pete Canelo, and I'm running for mayor of Albuquerque. I'd like to thank the congresswoman. I'd like to thank the senator. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Monaghan and Sue Fine Public Service also for being here. I think it's an honor to share the stage with uh, two of the individuals that I think are rising stars in the Democratic Party and who I have deep admiration for. As I said, uh, when I look out of this crowd, I feel like I'm with family. I was a government worker for 27 and a half years. Uh, my brother-in-law is an ex-police officer. He has returned to work as a police officer. And I have a son 
who is a volunteer firefighter at uh, Valencia County and is trying to become a firefighter here in Albuquerque. I'm running for Albuquerque because I have a deep love, a deep love for my community. My roots run extremely deep. I come from a working class family. My father was a World War II disabled American veteran and uh, he had a 10th grade education and he was a barber by trade. My mother, well, she was originally from Chacon, New Mexico. She had an 11th grade ed education and uh, she was a waitress. My mom and dad, my roots run extremely deep in Albuquerque. My mom and dad met at the Alvarado Hotel where my mother was a Harvey girl. She lived in the dorm and uh, that's where she met my dad. And this couple had a family of four. They instilled in me the importance of getting an education. They instilled in me the importance of working hard. And they instilled in me the importance of giving back to your community. And that's what I've done for 27 and a half years. It's because of their inspiration that I went back to school, got my degree in business administration, along with uh, a law degree. And when I was 12, my mother had to go back to work because my dad became seriously disabled. And she supported a family of five on the minimum wage. And that's why I stand before you and I offer myself, this is the type of working class family that I want to represent as mayor of Albuquerque. And I firmly believe that. I support uh, the minimum wage, and once elected, I will enforce it. I also support a woman's right to choose, but I also believe firmly that there should be pay equality with women and that uh, it should not be voluntary, but it should be mandatory. I also oppose a right to work law. This mayor supports a right to work law. But getting down to the big issues that I'm running on, again, I'm running because I have a deep love for my community. I do not like the direction our community has gone in the last three and a half years. And I believe Mr. Hay has pointed all this out. But I stand before you deeply humbled because as your mayor, I deeply respect those that uh, put their lives on the line, that basically uh, are police officers and firefighters. And as your mayor, I will never refuse to appear at any forum and disrespect you in the manner that has been disrespected today. That empty chair is a reflection of the empty leadership Albuquerque has had for the last three and a half years. And my goal is to turn our city around. I'm running on two private private principles, that of energizing Albuquerque. I want to invest in our community and invest in ourselves and have enough belief in ourselves. And Energize Albuquerque is a $1.5 billion investment in our economy. And we're going to do it without taxes. And we're going to identify the major, the major industries, the growth industries in the Albuquerque area. And we're going to bring new jobs to the Albuquerque area. I want my community to give my kids the same opportunities that I had growing up here. That is an opportunity to get a decent job to be able to settle down and have a family and enjoy life, but more importantly, to live life to its fullest, but also raise that family. And uh, I will do so as mayor of Albuquerque. I will provide the necessary leadership to pull us out of this and to make sure that we attract new industry with jobs and jobs that create our future. And we're gonna do that by identifying the growth industry. The second area is what affects each and every one in this room. Those of you that are firefighters, as well as police officers. We are having a complete meltdown when it comes to the Albuquerque Police Department and also failures within the Albuquerque Fire Department. As mayor of the city of Albuquerque, I will, I will reorganize both those departments. Uh, when I left as chief public safety officer, uh, I really believe we had two departments. Both departments were the best trained, best equipped, best manned, and best funded in the city's history. Both departments were at the top of their game, and we were ranked number one the academies. Three and a half years later, where are we at? The police department was in complete meltdown. When I left, we had 1,100 police officers. Now we're down to less than 900, with only half actually patrolling our streets. So with that, I want to thank you for the time. I'm asking for your vote, and I appreciate your consideration. Take care.
Um, I'm going to do a, a, a preface to my question. Um, I want to make sure that everybody in the audience is clear about the effects of the uh, lack of a federal budget and the lack of a generic or uh, broad federal appropriations package. Uh, because what we've been doing is allowing the sequester to continue, which is across the board cuts to every program uh, in the federal government. And so it has an immediate and, uh, I think, a dire effect on public safety. With that, and I uh, expect that the sequester, unfortunately, will continue. Given that, to both candidates, how could sequestration affect public services, and how will you fund police and fire departments if federal grants are cut and if the GRT drops? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I just go first. <laughs> you have three minutes. You know, I can't control anything the federal government does. No reflection on the senator here. I know she just hasn't been there very long. But in my opinion, the only thing I count on the federal government to do is fight with each other and get nothing done. We have to concentrate on what we can control. And what we can control is our gross receipts. We have to get this economy going. We cannot survive the way we are going. And we can't depend on the federal government to give us anything. If they do, wonderful. And if they don't, we're on our own. As I said, I've got a plan to jumpstart our economy that's going to put money in our citizens' pockets immediately. Immediately. While I work on the other problems of the police, of the drugs, and of the uneducated workforce, and the corruption within our government. I have to solve those problems before I can bring major industry in here. Because who's going to move here? Would you? With these problems? No. I have to solve those problems. Those problems are going to take a little while to solve. But I have to get money in people's pockets immediately. I have a plan to jumpstart the economy using our city to do that, and that will increase our gross receipts taxes. Our, when I jumpstart this economy, our hotels are gonna be full, our shops are gonna be full, our restaurants are gonna be full, and our citizens are gonna be working. And that's gonna be immediate. That's not gonna be a year from now, that's not gonna be two years from now, that's gonna be immediate. Because when 7,000 people stand online at a local retailer for 200 minimum wage jobs, there's a problem. We have to solve this problem. We've got to depend on ourselves and no one else. This is about us. Thank you. Congressman, sequestration is going to have a major impact on our city of Albuquerque. But I happen to believe that we have a mayor that wants to see it happen. He wants to see support. Uh, he wants to reduce the size of government. And his approach, I believe, has failed leadership. I do not believe he has a very good working relationship at all with our congressional delegation. Uh, I don't recall or do not know if he's even met with any of our congressmen or any of our senators. For that matter, I doubt if he's even tried to reach out to our New Mexico legislature to try to work with them. But the fact is, is that city, uh, this, this federal cutbacks are going to have a major impact on the city of Albuquerque. And you also have a mayor that has no problem with reducing corporate taxes uh, at the detriment of our municipalities. Uh, again, uh, the whole harmless provision, uh, they went ahead and enacted the last legislative session, uh, new uh, changes in the corporate taxes. But they also uh, did it on the backs of city government and also uh, municipal government, as well as our uh, uh, other types of governments, our county governments. And uh, we're going to be looking at a $36 million shortfall in gross receipts tax. And uh, I know as mayor, I will do whatever I can to work with our congressional delegations to reach across uh, party lines, even with uh, uh, the Republicans in, in the House, in the Senate, in Santa Fe. And it's, the goal is to work with our elected officials, both in the congressional delegation as well as our, uh, our uh, state delegation. And uh, I think that uh, we need to do whatever we can to make sure that government works, to make sure that there is no uh, effect on the delivery of services, 
I will always make sure that uh, public safety is priority one, and there will be no cutbacks when it comes to police and fire. And again, uh, the goal is to identify how can we change this and work with our congressional delegation to see what we can do to, to uh, uh, basically brace our city uh, and try to expand our economy. Because that is also part of the problem. We're going to have to get our uh, city moving forward again, uh, put forth uh, Energize Albuquerque, this uh, economic development plan where we're going to invest in ourselves and create new jobs and attract new industry to the Albuquerque area. That will assist us in increasing the gross receipts tax by having more business in the Albuquerque area and try to address the shortfall of gross receipts tax that we're going to be suffering here uh, once uh, all these federal cutbacks take into place. Thank you very much. State Senator Jacob Candelaria of Albuquerque, and Mr. Pinelli will get the first crack at this one. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and, and thank you to Diego and, and to our firefighters and policemen here for your invitation to join you today and, of course, for your service to our city. Uh, Mr. Dinelli and Mr. Hay, what is your stance on city council or a board of members uh, choosing both the police and fire chiefs and not the mayor of Albuquerque so that top public safety brass are allowed to run their departments without fear of losing their jobs or being subject to undue political pressure? I believe that uh, the mayor needs to have complete control over his department directors and have the authority to select those department directors. Why is that so important? It's important in order to hold them accountable for their actions. I think if you have uh, basically a submission of a chief as well as a, uh, a fire chief or uh, uh, police chief to be submitted uh, to the city council for approval, that politicizes it even further. And I think that's been part of the problem. Uh, you have a mayor that has basically failed in the leadership position uh, in the selection of the department heads. Keep in mind, this is the same mayor that appointed a political officer known as Darren White uh, as chief public safety officer. And he proceeded to really uh, take both of these departments and drive them into the ground. I believe as a mayor of Albuquerque, you have to hold your department directors accountable for their actions, to hold them responsible for the conditions of the department. I believe that they, you have to give them enough authority to run their departments. But to submitting their names uh, for approval to the city council, I think, is the wrong direction. And I do not believe that those, either one of those positions should be either be an elected position or appointed by the city council. So I would be very much against the uh, proposal, and uh, I would again uh, say that the only way you're going to be able to hold department directors accountable is to make sure that the mayor keeps them under uh, keeps them uh, uh, viewed and keeps them under control and holds them accountable for their actions, not interfere with their management. But if there's a situation where there's problems that you need to be addressed, the mayor needs to be able to call that director in and say, "Listen, if we have a problem, I want you to fix it. If you don't fix it, you're going to have to find another job." Folks, I consider myself a leader. I've been a leader my whole career. I'm a veteran. I've been a police officer in New Mexico well over 30 years. 25 of them, I'm proud to say, here, where I retired in 211 as a senior sergeant. A leader looks for other leaders. And in this one point, I have to agree with Mr. Janelli. We have to, as leaders, hold our leaders that we appoint accountable for their actions throughout the city, not just the police department, not just the fire department, but throughout the city, all managers. I want to hear from the rank and file. I've said this since day one. I am not going outside of Albuquerque to find a police or fire chief who will both be replaced the day I take office. The leader that I choose will come with suggestions from the rank and file of both the police and fire from Albuquerque. We are not too dumb in this city to solve our own problems. And I'm not going to pay somebody from Florida or California or Colorado or anywhere else and give them a job which should be done by one of our own. Somebody that understands our diversities, our cultures, 
And every police officer in this room or fireman in this room knows that every part of this city is different. The Northeast is a little bit different than the Northwest. The Northwest is a little bit different than the Southwest. The Southwest is a little bit different than the, than the Southeast. We're all Albuquerqueans. But the chief has to, both in the fire and in the police department, understand those differences. Rank and file, I depend heavily on them. I have people in mind, but rank and file may come up with ideas of somebody that I don't even think, that I'm not even thinking about right now. My instructions to the new police chief and to the new fire chief is going to be very simple, be a leader because they have got their work cut out for them. The police know that they have lost the trust of this community. And that new police chief is going to have to lead these officers into regaining the trust of the community. And I don't blame, blame the rank and file of either the police or the fire department. It's the lack of leadership at the top and it's the lack of leadership right there. He's not here today he wasn't at the Bosque debate last night when it was 500 people there. But you can be sure of one thing, he's gonna be at the ribbon cutting at Paseo and I-25 today. Thank you. The next gonna have a question from retired Albuquerque Fire Department Commander Robert Arriaga and Mr. Hayward answer first. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. What is your stance on privatization of public safety? <laughs> the simple answer, no. So all you see these uh, ambulances that are running around town from out of state, bye. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. But it's not just public safety. There is gonna be no privatization in this city, period. City services are cut. Because you bring in a private company, that private company is paying minimum wages to their employees. They have no respect for their job. They have no care for this community. When you have city employees, they own their job. They're proud, they have pride in their job. Whether it's the police, fire, transit, city security, solid waste, whatever the case may be, they have pride in their work. Once you get locked in to one of these private companies, oh, the price might be real good to begin with, looks real nice, and you start laying off city employees, well, how would you like to be one of those city employees that gets laid off and not have a job? I wouldn't want to be one. But once you lay off the city employees and you don't have any, guess what? Now the private company starts charging whatever they want, and you're locked in. You have no way out. There'll be no privatization in this city so long as I'm mayor. Unlike Mr. Berry, who has already started privatizing this city. And it's going to continue if he gets reelected. And I'll tell you the other dirty little secret. If he gets reelected, you can be sure, in my opinion, that Ray Schultz will be the next public safety director. You can take that to the bank. Thank you. Well, this is a question that I've always dealt with over the last 24 years. Uh, when I was an Albuquerque City Councilor, there was always an effort to try to privatize. Uh, they were talking about trying to privatize the Salt Waste Department. They were talking about privatizing the Convention Center. The bottom line is I've always opposed privatization. I will continue to oppose privatization. And as mayor, I will never allow it to happen the city of Albuquerque or any of its services. I think it's absolutely insane to think that you can privatize law enforcement or that you can privatize fire department services. These are basic services that government has to provide. Uh, that is the whole purpose of city government, the providing of essential services, the quality, uh, providing of quality essential services to the general public. Uh, Mr. Berry, on the other hand, he wants privatization. 
And I believe that the one department that has the biggest target that's on his back is that of the bus department or the transportation. Uh, he's already privatized the convention center. He's also privatized uh, some of the work at the zoo. And he's also privatized the uh, maintenance of some of our, uh, uh, some of the areas uh, uh, along the uh, center of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the highways. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, he's using private companies to do work that traditionally was always performed by city employees. And privatization basically is union busing. That's what he's really after. And again, it's the reduction of the size of city government. <laughs> this is the mayor that has gotten in front of uh, economic forums and talked about right to work. He's going to advocate right to work. And he opposes unions in any form. Take a look at what he's done to your unions. Uh, he's been an impasse now for three and a half years. This man does not want to work in good faith with you. This man wants to keep you at impasse. And on top of that, he wants to make sure that you work for less. Because he thinks that reduction, reducing the size of government is the way to go. It's the typical approach of union busting. The fact is, is that this is a growing community. It's a vibrant community. And we have to make sure that the services that are being provided to our citizens are done so by government employees that are dedicated, uh, dedicated to providing a good, solid service to the citizens of Alabama. Uh, you're looking at a former government employee I was a government employee for 27 and a half years. I took great pride in all the work I performed. And the fact is, is that uh, the key to this is making sure that we stop this merit and his activities, make sure that the union busting does not occur. But I will, under no circumstances, privatize anything within City Hall. I think it's nothing but a red herring to destroy the unions that are in Albuquerque, and that will never happen under my watch. Thank you. Mr. Hay and Mr. Donnelly, my question for you is this. What is your stance on labor unions and collective bargaining for the betterment of citizens of Albuquerque? My stance is very clear. I strongly believe that unions need to exist. Uh, they're here to stay. I believe that we need to treat them with dignity, respect, and honor. To act in good faith. To sit down and negotiate the terms and conditions of those contracts. Those are your rights. Those are the rights that you've earned over the years. And I also believe that uh, you have the most anti-union mayor we've ever had in Albuquerque's history. How many unions are they, does he have loggerheads with? He's called impasse on eight of the contracts on this. And they, the union, the most the police department and the fire department have now been working on the same contract for the last three and a half years. As your next mayor, I will, my goal will be to sign those contracts as soon as possible. And I will reopen negotiations and we will uh, uh, make sure that impasse is not declared, but we will negotiate in good faith. We will sit down, I will remove the individual that is now in charge of negotiating for the city. Uh, he does have a contract, he makes more money keeping you at, uh, at impasse than he does if you were able to sign a contract. So the goal will be to get back to the union table, to get back to the bargaining table, to sit down, to negotiate, to, uh, to negotiate in good faith. Because I think that's gonna go a long way to improving morale within the both departments. And it's going to go a long ways to ensure that we acknowledge the continuation of these unions. But uh, once again, I think the goal of this mayor is to basically bring all the unions to their, to their knees and not to uh, negotiate in good faith. And as your next mayor, you will see those contracts signed within, within six months to a year. Thank you. You know, folks, I said I'm the only true Republican in the race. I'm an old Republican. I believe in unions. I've been a union member my whole entire life. I'm still a union member, belonging to the Fraternal Order of Police. I started in upstate New York as a young man, worked in a factory for 12 years, the same factory my mother and father retired from. I became a police officer after that. I've worked my whole entire life, never was rich, but I've always been able to provide for my family. And I believe in unions because if it wasn't for unions, we'd still be making a dollar an hour probably. When we have the elite, such as Mr. Barry, 
looking at our union contracts and not honoring the contracts, but honoring everybody else's contracts in the city, all of his friends, all of the contractors. He said he can't break contracts, but he had no problem breaking the fire contract, the police contract, and every other contract across this city. I won't do that. I want strong city unions. I have never seen in this city, and I've been here 25 years, a union that was out of control. There have been some people in the union that have been out of control and they have been dealt with. But it is imperative that we be able to sit down and put our big boy pants on and talk like adults and solve our problems. We have to realize that everybody has to make a decent wage. And everybody, all the union members that I have spoken to and that I was part of, realize they're not gonna get rich doing this job. The only thing they ask is be able to provide for their families. And I don't believe that's too much to ask in this country and in this state and in this city. Thank you. Well, uh, interestingly for politicians, they've left us with a little bit of extra time, and we congratulate them on that. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe it might be an interesting uh, way for Mr. Benelli and Ms. Benelli to wrap up this give and take that they would ask each other a question that they feel is important uh, in this campaign of one another. So let me uh, put two minutes on the clock for this and have Mr. Benelli kick it off by asking Mr. Hay uh, a question of import in this Albuquerque mayoral race as he sees it, and then Mr. Hay can return the favor. Pete? Paul, I respect you immensely for the service to the community of Albuquerque. As a police officer, I was also a former military person. What do you think is the biggest threat facing our city? And uh, as far as making this a livable city, how do we turn this economy around? Well, I can't answer how to turn the economy around. It can be a lot of time, but I urge everybody here to please meet me outside afterwards or meet me in here afterwards, and I will tell you exactly how I'm going to turn the economy around. Our biggest threats are just a breakdown and understaff of the police department. Our biggest threat is what is going on in the fire department, where the mayor is saying, I'm gonna have paramedics all over this city. Rather than hiring paramedics, he's taking the existing paramedics and spreading them out around the city. It takes two paramedics to handle a call. So by having only one paramedic on one fire engine, the fire engine, if this paramedic gets a call, the other fire engine's gonna to have to come from the other side of the city, taking services away from that side of the city. We can't do this. The mayor's playing smoke and mirrors. The smoke and mirrors have got to be over. It's got to end. We have a broken police department, and it's not the rank and file. We, our city's awash in drugs, and our schools are awash in drugs. We have an uneducated uh, school system. These have all got to be tackled at one time. One's not important that, more than the other because we have to tackle them to fix the economy. And that is number one. People in this city are not working, and if they are working, it's part-time or minimum wage, if they're lucky enough to have anything. That is number one. You've got to fix these problems to fix the economy. As I said, I've got a plan to jumpstart the economy, and I am more than happy to share that with everybody in this room. Please, please, ask me after the debate, please. Paul, thank you. And thank you. Hold your place there, and then we'd like to hear your question, uh, if you have one, for uh, Pete Benelli today. Well, I asked Pete the same question he asked me. <laughs> and it's a good question. What do you feel is the most important problem facing the city of Elker at this time? Lack of leadership. As a native of Albuquerque, I'm deeply concerned about the future of our community. We have so much potential. We have so much we could accomplish. 
we have more faith in ourselves. What bothers me is that uh, what's happened over the last three and a half years, we've taken a beautiful city, and we take a look at the condition we were three and a half years ago. We had a city that uh, was attracting jobs. We had an economy that uh, we were on the top of all the, the good lists. Three and a half years later, we're on the bottom, we're at the top of all the bad lists. But uh, the economy is the number one problem, obviously, facing us. We've got to turn it around. It seems to me that we have a city that uh, was described as uh, the donut hole of economic development by the incumbent. He got in front of, in front of the Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce and said that. He said, Albuquerque is a donut hole of economic development. And then he went on to say, there's nothing he could do about it. And then he proceeded to blame the legislature. He blamed the legislature with all the fault. He also blamed Congress. They said he, there was nothing he could do about it. But he said he knew what the answer was. And his answer was a right to work law. And his answer was change the corporate tax structure. The fact is that this community has so much potential. Uh, we can revitalize our economy by having enough faith in ourselves. I've offered a new economic development plan called Energize Albuquerque. It's a $1.5 billion investment in ourselves where we will invest in our infrastructure. We'll invest in major projects that will increase the construction in the city. On top of that, we're going to identify major growth industries in the Albuquerque area. Uh, one of those growth industries is the transportation industry and also healthcare. And the goal is to attract new industry to the Albuquerque area. My economic development plan will create 15 to 20,000 jobs in the Albuquerque area. And uh, it's my belief that once we start turning this economy around, we're going to be able to solve our gross receipts tax problem. But no, what you have is a mayor that feels that a game changer is Albuquerque the plan, ABQ the plan, which is a $33 million investment in Albuquerque. And what's it investing in? Well, he wants to put uh, a whitewater rapid uh, feature out at the Blue Museum, and he also wants to build more baseball parks. He thinks that's a game changer. To me, that is thinking so small. And we have to understand and have enough faith in ourselves to invest in ourselves, to reach for the sky, and to really identify new industries to bring it out of the we're, le we're losing our youth. Kids that are my, my son's age are leaving Albuquerque in droves. We've got to stop. Thanks, Pete. we can do that is investing ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to our closing statements. I think we can do this in five minutes each uh, uh, to wrap up. It's been very productive, but they're going to want to tie up some of these ends. And Paul Hay will uh, begin his uh, uh, closing statement now, followed by uh, Keith Daly. Paul? Look, folks, I'm not a politician. I've never been a politician. I've never run for any kind of office. People say, well, how are you qualified then to be mayor? You've never been a politician. Really, you got to be a politician to be a leader? I don't think so. Do you think the governor designs her own budget? Or do you think the president designs his budget? No. They tell their staff, this is the direction we're going to go. How do we get there? This is what I want done. How do we do it? We are losing our best and our brightest. I go out to UNM all the time and I speak to the students. I say, hey, what are you going to do with your degree when you graduate? Move. Our dropout rate in our schools are horrendous, and nobody's doing anything about it. I have a specific plan to fix that. This city has to take care of itself. We can't be depending on the federal government. We can't be depending on anybody but ourselves. We can do this. It's time to think outside of the box and keep electing politician after politician after politician especially if we re-elect re Mayor Barry, we can't stand another four years of Mayor Barry. But doing the same thing over and over and over again is a definition of insanity. When you do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. I'm the new. I'm the different. I'm the never been done before. It's time for us to be bold enough and let's try the never been done before. 
because I guarantee you, you will have a true leader that cares about this community and cares about the city and cares about the entire city, including the city workers. Thank you. Every politician who's running for office or for re-election always says, you know, this election is about consequences and that this is the most important election ever in the history of mankind. The fact is, is that this election will have major consequences. Major consequences. On each and every one of us in this room. I was born and raised in the city. I love my community more than you can imagine. My roots run very deep. I have two sons that uh, were able to raise uh, with my wife for 29 years. And I want my city to afford them the same opportunities that I had growing up in Albuquerque. To get a good job, to get a decent education, to be able to raise their families. But what we're doing here is not working. I think that the uh, biggest characteristic of any leader, and the most important characteristic is that of courage. And um, courage of your convictions, courage to be able to stand up to groups of people, courage to answer questions, and hold yourself accountable and responsible for your actions. And anybody that uh, does not show up to a forum, a forum like this to answer questions from the very men and women that he asks to put their lives on the line has no courage, has no backbone, and has no solutions. <laughs> We need to have enough faith in ourselves to change the direction of our community. I want Albuquerque to become a destination city in the next four to eight years. I want Albuquerque to be able to attract new industry to the Albuquerque area, to be able to attract new businesses to the Albuquerque area, to expand our economy, where we can work a government that works with our congressional delegation, our, our state senate, to be able to change the direction of our community. What we have now is an individual that hides. He hides from other elected officials. He does not engage. And the fact is, you know, Paul and I disagree on a lot of issues. But at least this man has got courage. At least this man will stand up for what he believes in. But again, we need to change direction of our community. I believe I have 27 and a half years of a proven record, both as an elected official and I hold numerous positions at City Hall. I'm a 61-year-old man. I don't want to be congressman. I don't want to be a United States Senator. I don't want to be governor. All I want to be is mayor of Albuquerque. This is the second time I've run for this office. I'm a little grayer, a little fatter, but I've got the fire in the belly. I know what to do. I know how to solve problems. I spent 27 and a half years of my life solving problems, not only on the state level, but on the city municipal level. And uh, we've got a mess on our hands. We've got a mess at the police department. We've got a mess at the fire department. But more importantly, our economy is in shambles. And this mayor, he thinks his answers are tired old ideas from the Republican Party, and relying upon uh, his, uh, his cronies uh, from past administrations. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a serious consequence in this election. The fact is, we have to have a complete change in direction for our community. We have to have a real leader with courage and backbone to address our problems. And I think I can provide that to you. I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for your vote. I need your sweat equity. Uh, when I look at this union, both your unions, I was there when you needed me as a city council. I was there when we increased your salaries. I was there when we passed the public safety efforts. I was there when Albuquerque needed qualified <coughs> projects and we got those enacted. Now I need you. I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for your vote. Please elect me on October 8th. God bless you all, and thank you for, uh, for having me here, and God bless all of your comments. Congresswoman Michelle Lujan Grisham, New Mexico State Senator Jake Carmelaria, 
uh, retired Albuquerque Fire Department Commissioner Robert Larinaga and retired ATP Captain David Gilmore. We could have a, a round of applause for our panelists.